Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Signal Integrity. In this presentation, we'll explain the basic concepts behind signal integrity, including the most common signal integrity issues and how they're quantified. In this presentation, we're going to define signals as electrical quantities, that is, voltages, which are used to transfer information. Like everything else in the real world, signals are analog quantities, but nowadays, Signals are often used to represent digital information in the form of bits, or ones and zeros. For example, we can define voltages above this level as a logical one, and voltages below this level as a logical zero. A signal chain consists of three components, the transmitter, or the driver, the channel, or the interconnect, and the receiver. In most cases, the signals used for digital data are square wave type signals. As you may already know, these square signals actually consist of multiple frequency components. Another way of saying this is that we can make a square wave by adding together the odd harmonics of a signal. The greater the number of harmonics, the more square the signal becomes. Therefore, good digital data transmission typically requires two things. First, all the frequency components making up our square wave should undergo the same amplitude change. That is, they should all be amplified or attenuated by the same amount. Secondly, all the frequency components should have the same time shift or delay. If the amplitude change and or delay are different for different frequency components, signal distortion may occur. We can therefore define signal integrity as the ability of a system or signal chain to transfer signals without excessive distortion. Another way of looking at this is to say that signal integrity means being able to accurately reconstruct a transmitted waveform at the receiver. All data transmission systems introduce various types and amounts of degradations. In the past, we were often able to ignore many of these degradations because the rate at which signals changed was very low. That is, the rise time of the signal was fairly long. But as rise times decrease, signal integrity becomes a much more important issue and many modern, high-speed applications often have very short rise times. Note, too, that signals with shorter rise times also have more significant high-frequency components. There's no formal or standard definition of what makes something a high-speed system, but most engineers would consider rise times on the order of a nanosecond or less to fall into the category of high-speed. Therefore, signal integrity is most often associated with so-called high-speed digital design. Although the transmitter and receiver also play important roles in signal integrity, in this presentation, we'll focus on the influence of the channel. In an ideal channel, the signal may be attenuated or amplified as it travels from transmitter to receiver. There's also a delay due to the propagation time between transmitter and receiver. However, in an ideal channel, the received signal still has essentially the same shape as the transmitted signal. In a real channel, Frequency-dependent changes in the components of a signal can lead to changes in the received signal's shape, and this can make it harder for the receiver to correctly detect the transmitted signal level or to determine its state. And as we'll see later in this presentation, it's usually the higher frequency components that are attenuated more than the lower frequency components. Channels can have different physical formats. One of the most common types of channels is a trace on a printed circuit board, or PCB. The channel can also be in the form of connectors between different boards, or even cables between different components or systems. The principles of signal integrity and the way that degradations are measured or quantified apply to all of these different channel formats, but in this presentation, we'll be using PCB traces for most of our examples. In order to better understand signal integrity, we're going to take a look at four of the most common forms of channel degradation, impedance mismatches, frequency response, crosstalk, and noise. There are many other factors involved in signal integrity, but these are among the most important for high-speed digital design. To minimize degradations, a signal should see a constant impedance along the path or trace. Remember that impedance is a point concept, so there's no guarantee that the impedance in the middle of a trace will be the same as the impedance at the beginning or the end of a trace. If there is an impedance mismatch or change at any point, this can cause reflections, which in turn lead to signal distortion. 
there are many different sources of mismatch on a printed circuit board. Changing the dimensions, geometry, or direction of PCB traces is a common cause. This includes things such as the presence of branches or T's. Improper terminations or unterminated stubs can also cause reflections. The characteristics of a via, such as hole size, pad size, etc., will also affect its characteristic impedance. Discontinuities, such as those caused by device pins, variation in the PCB board materials, and the return path taken by the current are other common causes of impedance mismatches on printed circuit boards. Signals may also be distorted due to frequency-specific attenuation. Remember that attenuation or loss usually increases as frequency increases. If the loss were uniform for all frequency components, the received signal shape would remain the same. But when only the higher frequency components are attenuated, this can cause distortion of the transmitted waveform as it moves through the channel. One of the more common sources of frequency-dependent loss is the resistance of the conductors themselves. In addition, the characteristics of PCB materials will also create different dielectric losses at different frequencies. An additional source of frequency-dependent attenuation is a so-called skin effect. This refers to the phenomenon whereby higher frequency signals travel closer to the outside of a conductor rather than within it. This in turn creates self-inductance, which increases with frequency and leads to additional attenuation. Increasing the width of a trace to increase its overall surface area can reduce loss caused by the skin effect, but as we've just seen, changing trace geometry also creates impedance issues, and this is an excellent example of the kinds of compromises that are often encountered when designing for signal integrity. Crosstalk refers to the coupling of energy between adjacent conductors or traces. It's largely a function of geometric dimensions and positioning. Crosstalk can be created either by mutual inductance and or mutual capacitance. Often the terms aggressor and victim are used when describing this coupling of energy. In near-end crosstalk, the signal coupling occurs close to the aggressor's transmitter. In far-end crosstalk, this coupling occurs at the far end of the aggressor's trace. And just as with other aspects of signal integrity, crosstalk becomes a greater problem as signal rise time decreases. There are a number of different ways of minimizing crosstalk. Increasing the separation or distance between the traces, minimizing the length of parallel trace runs, and placing conductors close to the ground plane are some of the more common ways of minimizing crosstalk in PCB designs. Crosstalk could be considered an example of noise, since crosstalk is an undesired external voltage that is coupled onto our transmitted signal. As you might imagine, external noise that couples onto our signal can cause a number of problems, the most important one being that it lowers the signal-to-noise ratio at the receiver. Another common source of noise that contributes to signal integrity issues is noise introduced by the power supply, and therefore power integrity can be an important factor in overall signal integrity. Noise can also occur in the form of electromagnetic interference, or EMI, that's coupled in either from external or internal sources of noise. You may also hear this referred to as EMC, or electromagnetic compatibility, which also influences overall signal integrity. Another very important topic in signal integrity is something called jitter. Jitter can be defined as variations in the timing of the signal. Digital data signals are sampled at defined intervals, or bit times, where we use voltage levels at those times to decide if we've received a 1 or a 0. If the signal needs to transition between states, this transition must occur between the sample times. Variations in timing can lead to undefined or incorrect values at the sample times, and this in turn can create bit errors. There are many different types of jitter, such as data-dependent jitter, periodic jitter, random jitter, etc. As mentioned a moment ago, jitter is a very large but very important topic, so please see our separate presentations on jitter if you'd like to learn more. When it comes to testing for signal integrity, there are two complementary aspects, simulation and test and measurement. Let's look at each of these topics in a bit more detail. Simulation is important because it would be very expensive and time-consuming if we made an actual physical board, tested it for any possible signal integrity issues, and then repeated the process for each redesigned board. Simulation is used to produce output waveforms, 
based on models of a system or system components. It's performed using special software tools, in part because the calculations would be much too complex to do by hand. The output waveforms are calculated using models of frequency-dependent behavior. Simulation, therefore, helps us to make good design decisions and reduces the probability of signal integrity issues. The two primary test and measurement instruments used in signal integrity are oscilloscopes and vector network analyzers, or VNAs. Oscilloscopes are primarily used for time domain analysis of waveforms. Scopes usually have a relatively high input voltage range and are used to measure jitter and so-called eye diagrams, which we'll look at on the next slide. A VNA, on the other hand, is primarily a frequency domain instrument. VNAs have a high dynamic range, which is useful for measuring things like far-end crosstalk. VNAs can make S-parameter and TDR measurements as well. When it comes to signal integrity testing, one could say that oscilloscopes are used to measure the waveform, and VNAs are used to measure the channel. But in recent years, this distinction has become somewhat blurred. For example, some VNAs can use frequency domain information to generate eye diagrams. And eye diagrams are an important quality measurement in signal integrity testing. Eye diagrams are used to assess the quality of transitions between different voltage states. In other words, how cleanly does a signal transition from a 0 to a 1, or vice versa? They can also provide numeric information on parameters such as rise time, signal amplitudes, noise levels, etc. Eye diagrams are created by enabling persistence and overlaying multiple periods of a signal. Degradations will close or narrow the eye, and often the nature or cause of this closing or narrowing can be determined by visual inspection of the eye. In addition, masks can be used to quantify this level of closure. A mask is defined as a region or regions where the signal should not enter, and a failure can be defined as any time the mask is violated. Eye diagrams and masks are fundamental tools in signal integrity testing, and therefore standards will often specify the characteristics of the mask to be used during testing. Let's look at eye diagrams made at various points along a printed circuit board between the transmitter and the receiver. At the transmitter, we see a wide, relatively open eye diagram. As the signal moves through the channel, the eye will often narrow vertically and or horizontally. If the necessary steps are not taken to ensure adequate signal integrity, eye closure may prevent the receiver from being able to correctly recover the transmitted signal. Let's end with a brief summary. Signal integrity is an important consideration, especially in high-speed digital design, and this is primarily due to the shorter signal rise times found in most high-speed systems. Degradation of the signal can occur at any point along the signal chain, that is, in the transmitter, the channel, and or the receiver. Examples of common channel degradations discussed in this presentation included impedance mismatches, frequency response, crosstalk, and noise. And although we only briefly touched on it in this presentation, jitter is another important topic in signal integrity. There are several ways to test and troubleshoot signal integrity issues. Simulation is often used to model or to predict problems in the early design phases, whereas both oscilloscopes and vector network analyzers can be used to quantify signal integrity in actual physical systems. In particular, eye diagrams and masks are very often used in identifying and measuring the types and levels of signal degradations. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Signal Integrity. If you'd like to learn more about signal integrity or how signal integrity is tested, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.